time is passing us by. I know as we get older, we think time is flying. But I, can I tell you, it's the same that it's always been. We'll gain an hour, we'll lose an hour. But for the most part, we're still in a 24-hour day. We have eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and somewhere in between that, eight hours to find time for God. Now, when we begin to read in Hebrews 4, I want you to take note what God is trying to convey, not only to those who are outside, but to those who are inside the fold, that we would awaken and see people like they are, like God sees them. Some are on their way to heaven, and some are still looking for help. So let's begin our reading in verse 1. He said, this is, I believe, the Apostle Paul speaking. Let us therefore fear, this is a respect, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, if you remember real quick in Romans 3.23, it said we've all come short of the glory of God because we've seen it. And then verse 2 said, For unto us the church was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Now watch. But the word preached did not profit them, and problem not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That's a heartbreak. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place uh, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had not given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. And as you as I know, today many will go out into eternity not getting another day. He said, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did for his. Let us labor therefore to enter into into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I see three times where the problems associated with unbelief because people heard the word preached, but nothing happened. It didn't say they didn't get religious. It didn't say they didn't try. He said there was no faith mixed with the words that they heard, and therefore they did not enter into his rest. And verse 11 says again, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today in the name of our precious Lord Jesus. Father, what more could be said? What more could be done that your church could reach out and touch a lost and dying world? We're so emphatically in belief and agreement that we should send missionaries into all the world as you've commanded. But that does not free us as a church from not going into all our world and reaching lost mankind as we expect the missionaries to do for us. Now, I plead the blood of Jesus today that you will speak to our hearts. 
This is a message today that's always hard to preach and it's hard to proclaim because it makes us to think, have I done my part? Am I involved? Not only in the giving of missions, but am I passing out tracts? Am I sharing my testimony? Am I inviting people to church? Am I helping them to find the rest that I've entered into? So Holy Spirit of God, today we again proclaim the promises of God that we with the power of God might be about our Father's business. And you have already given us instructions on what things will be like in the last days. You told us that perilous times would come and I believe we would all be in agreement today that we've seen these perilous times. And there's not a doubt in our hearts that they're not going to become more perilous as time approaches. So that tells us that things are really rapidly going toward the coming of our precious Lord. And I hope we've done our best. I hope we've went and given and shared and become the light of the gospel that you've asked us to be. For one day when the great white throne judgment is proclaimed, there'll be people maybe pointing fingers and saying, you told me nothing. You didn't warn me. You didn't tell me. You, you didn't tell me about time. So Father, help us as a group of believers to be challenged in the time that we have left to reach our neighbor, somebody that we work with, somebody that's on our heart, somebody that we're constantly thinking about. God, send us with a burden and compassion to give and to share and to be. Oh, God, we're the only gospel that many will ever see. So thank you for the time that's presented. So help us today and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your standing. I want you to hold your place, Hebrews chapter 4, and then I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. And the reason why I wanted to bring out in, in Hebrews chapter 4 about the church is because many of these people are in and out of church. They're sitting in pews. They're under the gospel. As I told you last Sunday, I'm listening to preaching somewhere almost every single day. And the messages that I hear, they're preaching everything but the gospel. They're sharing concepts and ideas of life changes and how to be a better person and how to be a successful person. But they're forgetting to warn people about the coming of our Lord. They're forgetting to tell people about the judgment of sin because God will bring every judgment into account. Now, the three verses I'm fixing to read to you, I want you to take note because these are church people that have done their best, tried to walk the line of Christianity, and they heard the worst news of eternity. Look at verse 21. And this is kind of what my introduction was this morning. He said, not everyone that saith unto me. This is our Lord talking. He said, they're not all going to say, Lord, Lord, capital L, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But then the rest quotation said, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, that person will be going to the kingdom of God. So your heart says, well, what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is that we accept his Son and the fullness of the payment for our sin that his bloodshed will not only cover my sin, but it will give me a home in heaven for eternity. Now notice the quotation. Many will say to me, Christ still talking, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, and where do you prophesy except usually in church, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name, the Lord Jesus now, and in thy name have cast out 
devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Now, these are those who are testifying to Christ who addressed him as Lord, Lord. Do you remember all the great things we did? We prophesied and we cast out devils for you. And in your name, we believe we've done a lot of wonderful works. Now Jesus' response to their quotation. And then I, the Lord Jesus, will profess unto them, see if your Bible reads like this, I never knew you. Now wait a minute. Before I finish, how can God, the creator, the savior of the world, tell these wonderful church people, I not only don't know you, I have never known you. You mean to tell me I sit in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, and you don't know me? Of all the things that I've done in your name and you say you don't know me? The Lord has got a message he's trying to tell people who play church. He says, depart from me. And if I was good old country poor, I would say, just get out. I don't know you. We have nothing in common but wait a minute, did I not just remind you of all the things that I have done for you? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what are you saying, dear Lord? You're calling everything that I've done, the wonderful things that I've done, you're calling it sin? He said it was done for yourself. I don't know you because you've never come to me in simple faith, and you've never bowed your heart and asked for forgiveness, can I just say it this way? You've never repented of your sin. You've joined churches, you carry a Bible, you sing the songs, but you've missed the mark. We've all sinned and come short, as Hebrews said, we come short of the grace of God. We've missed the mark. God had a level and a mark of perfectness and we've all missed it. So thank God for Jesus Christ coming and saying, I'll bridge that gap. Let me have your hand and I'll take the hand of the Father and I'll unite you together as it's supposed to be. There are some who are saying, no, I don't want to grab your hand. I don't know what the long-term results are is taking your hand and following you. I kind of like just going to church as I please and going through the motions. I think this will suffice because I'm going to offer you at a time all the wonderful things that I've done. I hope the scripture bears out to those. Jesus will say, depart from me. You need to go. This is not your home. Your home is where you have made your bed. You'll sleep in it. You've lived your life. You've tried to pretense that sin was not that bad. Because can I tell you this morning, church, the world as a whole has accepted sin. It don't matter what sin. It don't matter what kind of ungodliness. Listen, when we've come to accept murdering children as a way of life. Yeah, they might call it abortion, but I call it murder. And when we've changed the names of drunkenness to alcoholics, no matter how we label things, God still calls it sin. And listen, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. He loves you despite all the sin and he wants to save you from your sin. These three verses of Scripture looks like they're so out of context as far as in Matthew chapter 7. We're talking about the two ways and we're talking about the false prophets and the two foundations and then right in the middle of that, he said, let me give you a story about some church people that believe in their heart 
they're coming to unite with me. But I've got a message to tell them, you don't belong here. There's no blood been applied to your life. You're still in your sins, and you're, ho and you're headed for a hopeless eternity. So today I'd like to title this, this message, if I could, The Life and Death of an Unbeliever. I probably should have inserted the words, because of our text, a religious unbeliever. We just read Matthew chapter 7. Take your Bibles and let's go back to Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to just give you a couple of thoughts this morning about the lifestyle of somebody who's religious. What's going to happen in this life and, of course, the life to come. Many wish that death would end all things. It would just be over. And for some, they believe that. Some believe there's a soul sleep that one day you'll be awakened and you'll get to go out of the grave into heaven. And all these things that people's ideas, but yet they can't say, thus saith the Lord. Because our God has never granted any kind of theology of those teachings. Heard a man the other day teaching on, if you've not been baptized, you're going to wake up in hell. We heard in Sunday school that if you eat pork, you're going to hell. That's the ideas that some people have. If that's the case, boy, the bacon I just consumed this morning, I'm in deep trouble. But we know that didn't come from the Bible. That's another man's ideas. So how did the people in Matthew chapter 7 get so confused, get so misled, get so to the point where they can't see the truth, when hopefully somewhere in a church service is somebody said, you must be born again. And they tell them that we're on our way to a hopeless eternity and that we need to awaken to the truths that we've sinned. We've all sinned and come short. So therefore, we must seek help to get into the life that we all so want, I want to go to heaven. Man's desire to please himself is what our world teaches. You know, live for the gusto. Get all you can because you might only have one chance. They teach us that the crowd's always right. Well, the crowd crucified our Lord. It was only right, and that was God's plan, but they thought they were doing Rome and, and Judaism a favor by crucifying the one that even Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. They want to be accepted. They want you to look at them as you agree with them. They follow you. They follow the lifestyles. But I found out that in life, for the most part, people are looking for something. They might not know completely, but their heart seems to be yearning and searching for something that fulfills. They go in and out of marriages because, well, she's not everything I thought she was and God bless her, I wish she would say, well, you know, you're not everything I thought you was. So we change, but love covereth a multitude of sin. In your bulletin this morning, there's a wonderful little text message about love. The right kind of love, of love that changes the way we see things. People spend most of their lives looking, searching. People look for a better Bible. They're looking for the ultimate church. I seen one yesterday where the pastor was, let me tell you about our new church, our new work. So I said, well, I'll give him a listen to find out what this new church is. And he began to tell me everything that he's going to do for you, do for your kids, he's going to do for your marriage, He's going to do to make you happy. In his probably about eight-minute speech, 
Jesus was never mentioned. Bible was never mentioned. Because I was listening because it's one of those churches without a denominational name. So you basically don't know where they're at. And I think he basically said, if you want to know more, you'll have to come. And if you come, I promise you, we'll find some area to please you. I thought the Bible taught us that we're not to please ourselves, but to please the Lord. So if you're looking to be a better person, you're looking to be happy and contented in church activities, that's the church because he promised to help you and your family and your marriage. But he basically said, I'm going to help you. Beware of false prophets. For they try their best to be sheep when they are inside wolves. They're deadly, they're dangerous, and they're things that we should pay attention to. I'm so glad God gave us a copy of the Word of God. We can read it for ourselves. And there are some books in this Bible that are hard. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there are some, there are some tough ones. But if you do scriptural references, you can pretty well get an idea of what God is saying even in the Old Testament. Now, I have to admit, some of those names, wow, they're pretty tough. But, but I do give it a shot, and then I go back and listen and see how close I was. So I told you today I wanted to tell you something about the life and death of an unbeliever. Number one, the life of an unbeliever is spent in vanity. Psalms 78, listen to these two verses of Scripture, verse 32 and verse 33. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble you see, this is the time that God was feeding Israel in the wilderness and they complained. They were being fed by manna and they said, well, the manna's great, but we need meat. We're just never satisfied that we have to go out every day and pick up this manna. Wow. I believe it was so full of sugar and wonderful spices it just melted in their mouths. A life spent in vanity. Whether 50 years, 70 years, 80, however long, but it's a life lived to yourself. Solomon would even say through the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that he said, I've seen everything under the sun. I've seen it all. I've experienced it all. And he said, my statement of life is it's really full of vanity. It's so empty. There's just really nothing outside of God. Let me give you two things about life spent in vanity. Number one, it's empty, but they play along like they're contented. Remember Matthew? They were going to church. They were picking up songbooks. They were singing, and they might have even stood and testified. They were doing what the group was doing, meeting, singing, and they thought they were worshiping. They are empty, but they played along as so not to be noticed. You know, we call them in Hollywood actors. They can play any part. All they need is a script and some wardrobes and they can play somebody from the dark ages to gunfighters unto somebody of this day. It's just a session of acting. And if you're not careful, church people can get caught up in the acting of church because it's just something they do. 
I mentioned to somebody just a little bit back about you ought to come to church, and their quotation was, well, I go to church. And I said, boy, you sound pretty excited about it. He said, well, you know, church is church. Well, I mean, what else is there? I hope our church is not just church. I hope it's a place of worship. Because you've spent time to get ready and come to the house of God looking to hear something from God. I have a heavy heart. I want God to literally awaken me to the problems that's not only in my life, but I want to see the pains and sorrows of others. Number two, their life is wasted. And for many, they're sitting at home today watching Facebook Live. As a matter of fact, I've heard some of them say it. It's pretty great that you can drink your coffee, prop up in bed, in your pajamas, and watch church. They didn't say go to church. They said watch church. The only thing about that good is you can pause it at any time. You can't pause me. I don't slow down long enough to pause. But the life of an unbeliever is spent in vanity. Number two, the life and death of an unbeliever, one who is already condemned. Here's what I've heard over the years of witnessing. Don't judge me. Don't condemn me. And I had to give him John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He's already, she is already condemned. So if you die in your sin, the judgment is just ahead for your sins. What has condemned us? The words that we speak condemn us. Many have told Jesus they love him. They love him with their lips. And he responded, but your heart is far from me. Those in Matthew chapter 7, if the Lord had told them, not only do I not know you, but your heart is so cold and so vile, you don't know me. Because Jesus will warm the heart of every sinner's. So the words that we speak, they betray us. I see this on Facebook a lot. If you were put on trial because you're a Christian, is there enough things in your life that would condemn you as a Christian? Would you be judged? Yep, we've been around you. We've seen and heard. You're no doubt one of those. Remember, that's what was happening to Peter. When he was warming himself around the fire, they said, you sound like you were with him. No, no, I don't know him. And she said, your speech betrays you. Wow. Has our speech betrayed us that we are Christians? Our words speaks. The works of our hands tell exactly what's going on in our hearts. How could people murder somebody? I seen one the other day. I, I like to watch those crime shows for a fact that they always find them. And they think they were going to get away. And one young teenager, because his girlfriend refused him, he stabbed her 87 times. How could that hand, that innocent young teenager, not only take the life, but try to do it in such a way as to destroy the physical body 87 times. How could that hand do that? Because the heart was completely cold. The heart said, well, you'll never refuse anybody else. And not only to take her life, but he tried to destroy it. These hands are capable of almost anything. Doctors take the lives of these unborn babies like it's no big deal. I read the other day there's a great harvesting out there for body parts. 
It's a billion dollar business. They're taking people, putting them under anesthesia, literally in their homes or in their cars, and taking them and taking hearts and lungs and liver. They're taking body parts because it's a tremendous price for the things they're selling. Are you kidding me? Doctors, people. Why? These hands are capable of doing anything. The Bible says these unbelievers are already condemned. You're not going to be. You already are. Number three, the life and death of an unbeliever is one who will end up dying in their sins. They've lived in sin, even though they've tried to be righteous, self-righteous. They've tried to act. They fooled everybody but God. John chapter 8, verse 24 said this. Now, listen to what Christ says. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And the payment for sin, oh my goodness. The judgment is eternity separated from all that is holy and righteous. I haven't even talked about the pain and the suffering of the flames from hell to the lake of fire. But they had it their way and they died in their sin. Let me give you two things. Number one, they had no faith in God. I didn't say they didn't have faith in the church because remember, here in Hebrews 4, We've been reminded, look in verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached, and it worked for us. Now watch this, as well as unto them, they heard the same gospel. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Some yield to faith, trust in Christ, repent of their sins, their lives are changed. They become children of God. A mansion is being prepared. They're on their way to heaven. But they had no faith in God. And number two, they had no fear. They did not doubt for a moment what they were going through was not good enough. The Bible tells us all through Old and New Testament, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They have forgotten to fear the Creator. Number four, the life and death of an unbeliever is... One who's been blinded by the God of this world. They've lived. They partied. And they got to the end of this life and thought that the party would continue in the next. But according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world, little g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look at verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example. The same example of faithless and unbelief. He said, I've warned you about the examples. As a matter of fact, when Brother Gary Shark was preaching uh, last Sunday, he gave example of example of example of example for people who are waiting for a better day and a better time. But we found out that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that he blinded their minds. They just could not see the truth. Why? Because their heart was not looking for more. They were going through the motion and it seemed to suffice. It seemed to be enough. So then he blinded their eyes and just couldn't see it. 
At a time, their conscience gets seared with a hot iron. Nothing seems to bother you about God, heaven, hell, eternity. It's just kind of okay. Let's not get bent out of shape. And let me close with this. The life and death of an unbeliever is one who will be judged with the worst sinners in history. Can you imagine? Somebody leaves the church pew and wakes up and they're standing behind Hitler. They're standing behind Charles Manson and say, I'm in the wrong line here. I mean, these people were wicked and vile. I don't belong there. But you've died in your sin. You're all going to get what's coming to you. Revelation 21.8 gives us an example of the kind of unbelievers that will be there. He said, but the fearful and unbelieving. Yeah, Hebrews tells us that they were unbelieving. And the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and he said, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. He said, this is the second death. As we stand to our feet this morning, let me conclude with this thought. Please don't let God's best pass you by. God has already planned and paved the way for you that you can have the best, even what you don't deserve, because God has already warned you what's going to take place. Don't play the game. Don't go through the motions. Don't pretend and don't act. Just be real. After all, I'm sure the people in Matthew chapter 7 were absolutely shocked beyond belief when they heard those words, Depart from me, for I never knew you. To be judged like a hardened criminal? Are you kidding? To be judged for every sin that I've ever thought and committed and for getting the worst punishment for all time in hell, then to the lake of fire, then to be there eternally. Can I say this morning, please come to Jesus while there's time before it becomes too late. Father in heaven, this is not a shouting, running the aisles message. This is not a time of raising our hand to God's glory, but it makes us think. It makes us ponder our thoughts. It makes us look. We could have read Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus this morning, but I thought this was as good a way as any besides somebody tuning us out. Well, I've already heard that. Oh, we know people that according to their testimony, they don't know you, they pretend to know you, but we know deep in their heart, they're actors, they're phonies. And if I can go so far as to use the word, they're hypocrites. They're pretending to be something they're not. These that were given you in Matthew chapter 7 were never your children. They wasn't one time your children and because of their lack of faith was lost because you said you've never lost any. So dear God, help us with a new burden to reach out and touch somebody with a gospel track a church invitation, something that we can say in our hearts, I'm free from the blood of all men. Their blood is not on my hands. My hands are clean. I've done my best. I've given my all. So, Father, please awaken churches far and near to the fact it's not all about me and the good times and, and giving me what I want. What about those who are not in? They're separated. They're still in their sins. God in heaven, awaken your churches to the fact time 
is passing us by. God in heaven, forgive us of our sins, our shortcomings. Help us now in this invitation, oh God, to awaken ourselves. What can I do? What more can I do to be a help? To share the love of the gospel that you might let the glorious light shine into their darkened hearts and they will say, thank you for bringing me the hope that I was looking for. Help us now in this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.